Welcome to the Cloud Pod, where the forecast is always cloudy. We talk weekly about all things AWS, GCP, and Azure. We are your hosts, Justin, Jonathan, Ryan, and Peter. Episode 109, recorded on March 17th, 2021. The Cloud Pod hopes all fault injections are simulated. Good evening, Ryan, Peter, and Jonathan. Hey, Justin. How's it going? Hello there. You know, it's been an interesting week. It's almost over. But it hasn't just begun. It's kind of an odd combination. Wednesdays are weird. It's kind of 2021, you know. <laughs> well, I still feel like 2021 is very much 2020, just extended. But, you know, with more positivity in the end of it mm-hmm. than 2020 had. It is definitely fun to see it lighter out a little later. Ugh, daylight savings time? No, that's a terrible travesty against the nation that should be stopped at all costs. I mean, you could well, just the have... changing, I agree with, should be stopped, but we should just leave it as it no, is. No, we should just leave it. Like, we've now changed. You're now making me go through it for this time. Like, just stop doing it now. Just, it's fine. Yeah, I'm okay with this. You could just have looked out the window an hour earlier, Peter, instead of having to change the clock. <laughs> <laughs> what if I set my... Let me just change my uh, own clock. I just think about all the companies that I've had to deal with time zone changes, issues, you know, code. And then if we actually eradicated this, there's thousands of lines of code that had to be thrown away in every application that processed daylight savings time. And I'm wondering, like, what kind of party you should throw in your development cycle when you remove that code or you just comment it out or whatever. You're well, that'd be the funny thing. Maybe it's it would be, you know, in reverse. The fact that you, if you leave the code in and there is no time change, it also breaks in a spectacular fashion. Well, I was wondering all the hacks you might be able to do for it. So maybe you... Maybe because you you couldn't figure out how to rip it out of your code because it's too embedded, you set basically the time zone change is going to be at 3 a.m. an uh, hour forward, and then at 3.01 it's going to be an hour back. <laughs> so like, there's this weird like this weird little glitch in your metrics and stuff. Like, like I see all these like really weird, like terrible workarounds because you're you know it's so embedded in your code, you just can't easily rip it out. Like there's there's so many interesting scenarios though. I wonder how many developers would lose their jobs if we didn't have to take into account time changes. Probably not enough to one save two GDP of a hundred. <laughs> You'd have to I mean, like collectively across together. all companies that deal with day at the same time. It's probably a reasonable yeah. number when you aggregate them all together. But it's like three percent of one developer's time, <laughs> twice a year, where he curses out daylight savings time and then moves on with his life. So now the real savings is in the QA for that, right? Because the QAing that's yeah. a nightmare. Oh, oh change yeah. the time, run away, change the time, run away. Watch it. You know, watch the seconds click by as you wait for it to hit the window where it changes, and then <laughs> you know, and then all the different scenarios you're trying to test. Like, well, okay, well, I have a job running, a batch job running during the time window change. What happens with the data? And like, oh, there's so many weird yeah. edge cases that have come out of it. It's got to be no fun. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we're through that. I don't have any issues with my IJ job, but. Yeah, I'm sure someone did out there because it never failed. Every company I've been at somewhere has some type of daylight savings time mistake that happens twice. It's usually me missing a meeting. Though that's just human error. Like I will say that I missed the first meeting on Monday morning. <laughs> Absolutely, because the time changed. Like it, I felt like I was in college all over again. Yeah, and like it was like I couldn't graduate then. I couldn't. You know, I still can't manage daylight savings. Well, and they they like to pretend that because they do it on Saturday night that it it makes it better. So on Monday you're prepared, but Sunday I just sleep through and I'm like, wow, it's really late today. You're like, wow, how is it so late already? And then Monday is when it actually hits you and you're like, oh, yeah. I hate son of. All right, well, let's move on to other topics <laughs> from daylight savings time. First up, you know, I don't even know how long ago this was because it feels like it was a hundred years ago. But you know, at one point Docker was on bad, you know, on the end of days, selling off their enterprise business to Mirantis. We talked about it here on the show leaving behind, you know, Docker Hub and Docker Desktop. And really, you know, they were trying to pivot away from the enterprise play, which they had failed at because Kubernetes ate their launch, unfortunately. And so Swarm was dead and, you know, Mirantis was going to take that carcass and try to make something out of it, which I don't know if they have or not. I haven't kept up with them. But, you know, basically they've now come out and said uh, things are going pretty well. This new change has made them kingmakers in many ways for coders. And so its original trajectory of selling to enterprise fell flat, like I mentioned. And so now its two biggest products are Docker Desktop and Desktop Docker Hub. Docker Hub recently made waves when they increased the costs for hosting containers for many organizations and caused fun downtime issues. And with this growth in the developer community and top-line revenue growth, apparently they've secured an additional $23 million in funding from investors, meaning they're in a much better place. And their CEO is out touting that to the press in a big way. So we talk, we talk about it. But you know, I don't know about how solid that $23 million in, fund, in funding is considering it's tied to revenue which that revenue is tied to them changing Docker Hub at the last minute and giving you absolutely no time to change your pipelines or update your code. And so everyone just, you know, subscribed for whatever fee they could just to get through it. 
I'm not so sure this is going to work out long term, but we'll see how those renewals go next year. Well, I tell you, that's when I'd raise money. Yeah, <laughs> you do it before the cost, you know, the, the yeah. profit starts drying up or before the cost model goes out of whack with your revenue. That's the key step. I was at a startup where we missed the uh, the funding round that needed to happen before the cost started going through the roof <laughs> to take market share. So we started taking market share in a way, big way and our cost model started following the market share. And uh, the investors were like, wait a minute. And that was the end of that one. Too late. We got the money. In the- Too late. Ready to give us the money. <laughs> but, you know, there was just, you know, it was one of those areas where tech tech killed the company because you were, we were too busy focusing on features and not, you know, doing things like dedupe and the storage tier and other optimizations. So then, you know, you're burning through a cabinet of storage a day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, things aren't going so well in the cost model side when you don't focus on that kind of stuff. So it's a good, uh, good lesson in startup economics. All right. Amazon has uh, given us some faults with the new fault injection simulator or Fizz for short. This new service will help you to perform controlled experiments on your AWS workloads by injecting faults and letting you see what happens. I would typically refer this to it as chaos engineering and there's many companies like Gremlin and others who do this outside of the native tooling. And so Amazon, though, is now giving you the ability to do it natively in the platform to avoid failures like regions, availability zones, cloud watch issues, auto scaling, load balancing, cross region replication, and lots more to be tested all by their dirty little secrets. Using the Fizz, you'll learn how your system handles failure modes or doesn't handle them, which is ideal. And you can start by running experiments in pre-production environments, which I highly recommend, and step up to running them as part of your CI/CD process and maybe never eventually production. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe never, never huh? Because, you know, I've, I've been yeah. so successful getting that, you know, in place with Gremlin and Chaos Monkey in the past. Exactly. I'm blown and away so that it's taken such a long time, right? Turn this into a managed service. I mean, Chaos Monkey is 10 years old this year. And Netflix I mean, has been on stage how many times or, or been touted how many times at reInvent everything else as being sort of the leaders in this space. But yeah. that's a long and time. And this capability is something that's been in the well-architected framework for years and years and years as well. I mean, has Netflix stopped updating the Chaos Monkey tooling again? You know, they've had ebbs and flows on the Chaos Monkey tooling where they've you know, done a lot of releases and it's been really great. You've been able to adopt it. And then it kind of gets stale over a year or two as they rewrite it internally. And then they release a new version of it. And, you know, then we kind of repeat the cycle over and over again, because I'm, I'm not sure it's a super well-funded initiative inside Netflix. So, you know, I'm glad to see Amazon take it on because I think it's what customers need to do their particular work. The first version of this only covers EC2, ECS, EKS, and RDS, as well as some of the AWS APIs. And so this is a pretty good starting place, I'd say, for most people. And if you are in any region except for Osaka or China, you can use this today. And those regions are coming very, very soon. So for instances, you can experiment by rebooting your server out of the nowhere, stop it, terminate it, whatever you want to do to it. For ECS, you can drain your container instances, which basically means you're taking your node out of rotation. For EKS, you can terminate your node group instances. And for AWS APIs, you can give them internal errors, API throttle errors, or API unavailable errors randomly. And then for RDS databases, you can fail them over and reboot the DB cluster and then they even give you some systems manager actions, which are the really evil ones, to either send any command you want to to the host, <laughs> do a CPU stress, a kill process, or a memory stress, and introduce network latency, which is really kind of the big stuff that I'd be looking for in most of these services. You are charged based on the duration of the action is active, so the cost is $0.10 cents per action minute. And so if, let's say you had two actions that ran for 20 minutes and one for 10 minutes, that would equal 50 action minutes and cost you $5. So cheap. One of the nice things, too, is that you can set this up with CloudWatch so that if your CloudWatch alerts just start blowing up, you can actually have it undo what it did automatically. So you can uh, avoid more impact than you expected from your chaos. Oh, I thought it was going to be the opposite. Like, if you're having a normal problem in your environment, then it could trigger Fault Injector to cause more problems. <laughs> oh, imagine how they tested Fault Injector Simulator before they made it production service. They must have actually Fault Injected into the Fault Injector oh. Simulator. I cannot <laughs> wait for Fault Injector Simulator to go wrong and start injecting faults where it doesn't belong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and yeah, that's what. Do we ever get the root cause in the Kinesis thing? We well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is amazing, though, if you think about how much effort companies have had to go through, like, big money and time to build this capability and then or you now you can have it for obviously five dollars is a small test but to get one test done prior to this it was i bet hundreds of thousands of dollars to millions of dollars for corporations to build this capability and you can have it for five bucks i mean think about just testing dr you know like that kind of thing you know so not only are you testing for resiliency but actually like 
properly testing your processes. You know, I've been in so many places that have engineered that solution to either simulate fault or just document the manual process of like go here and disable this health check. And see yeah, happens. we've been waiting for something to make this easy to like to where we could do game days as an educational experience with customers instead of the, you know, Amazon has done the unicorn one. But I think that it'd be really easy now to develop your own game days internally or I mean, I can't wait to do it for customers. Because it wasn't something that was easy to just plug and play. Like, you know, whether you're using Gremlin or Chaos Monkey, like it took a little bit of thought and planning to put it in there. It wasn't something that you could do instantaneously. Yeah. And there's this fear. I mean, even with Gremlin, when you talk to them, they very clearly tell you, make sure you experiment, make sure you understand what you're doing and really plan out your usage of these tools. And I would say the same thing for Fizz. You know, make sure you really understand what you're trying to do, what you're trying to test and, you know, put your theory in place and then go test your theory just using scientific method to prove that it works or doesn't work as you expected it to. I just want to connect this thing to a random function for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I remember making a PFR for this. And originally it was like, well, they asked kind of how they should implement something like this. And I said, well, maybe they should just have a very unreliable availability zone, which you could subscribe <laughs> to. <laughs> and then they said, just use USC one anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> We already have that one. You said it. I didn't. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I mean, it's a nice MVP, but it doesn't scratch any of the big services which have been failing in the past few years. So it doesn't touch S3 yet, which is disappointing. Kinesis would be another big one. You know, I mean, you saw how crucial that was. You can maybe get close, though, with some of those AWS APIs if you could say, you know, I want you to throw throttle errors or unavailable errors on S3. So, I mean, you can get some of them or Kinesis, but I do suspect you'll see additional services come to this over the next year. Yeah. I mean, what I wanted to do is I wanted to respond that it's actually going to do what I asked, like when we asked it to spin up EC2 instances, but then never actually spin up EC2 instances because that was one of the EC2 control plane failures where you're perfectly happy to accept a request, but then just didn't do anything. Yeah. Them or put them in a queue that just didn't get executed for days on end. Well, and I think all of these, if you really look at them, it's really about you managing an environment, assuming Amazon is working the way it's supposed to. And when it's working the way it's supposed to, Sometimes instances go away. You should account for that. But yeah, I don't think they're they're going to help you troubleshoot if they roll out a really bad ELB piece of code or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, for those of you who are doing a lot of storage on S3 and would like to test it, you know, you can't do that yet. But if you're using Glacier, which is a great product offering you a terabyte of data for four dollars per month. It's a great use for a lot of those type of activities where you don't need to access data quite often. But there are some sharp edges, and I learned about them in the hard way, personally, (laughs) along with some other of my co-hosts here, (laughs) when nutrition data in and out of S3 Glacier. And so this new announcement makes what those sharp edges a little less sharp. So effective March 1st, S3 Glacier is now more cost-effective than ever before as they're lowering the charges for put and lifecycle requests by 40% for all AWS regions. And you can now also use the S3 put API to directly store the data in S3 Glacier without having to use a lifecycle API, which is pretty nice. So previously, if you had turned on lifecycle management of an S3 bucket and you said, I want to take all my data that's in this bucket that's over 30 days and like to just move it over to AWS Glacier, you could do that. And then you get a really big bill for all of the transactions that were moving to the other bucket. And so, you know, there's ways you can do it with batching and other ways that Amazon would highly recommend you do to avoid those costs that they didn't do for you. And so this is one of those areas where your cloud provider sort of fails you, unfortunately. But uh, this is great for those that need it and need the ability to put and lifecycle actions and want a much more cost-effective way to do that. This might be a great option to do model this out for your use case. Yeah, the funny thing is, you know, the warnings when you enable a very expensive lifecycle are all in the UI. And so if you're a heavy uh, automation proponent, you get no sort of warning. When, uh, that, when that's going to cost you a lot of money. You can't complain about the, the UIs. Oh, you've got to type delete me, really. All this, all this junk in the UI. And then complain that you didn't use the UI. You I can. can. You I will. totally can. It just makes me a hypocrite, which I'm yes. fine. <laughs> <laughs> he must be an expert. He's using the UI. Yeah. <laughs> I know this. It's a Unix system. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, they could output the warning that they give you in the UI to the console and say, hey, you just enabled something that might be expensive. You should probably review the console and maybe give you a link to it to see what's going to cost you. Can you stop on those jobs once it started, though? I'm not, I'm not sure you can. Yeah, wait, that's how we no. stopped it from spending nope. a lot more money. No, no, no. No, we didn't. We could remove the life cycle so that it would stop doing the damage. But once that was submitted, it was it's because it's in a completely asynchronous. What about system. like an app where if like... Anything that's going to happen that's going to cost more than like whatever, 2000 bucks, 
somebody has an app on their phone and it just pushes a notification. You got to hit the yes button within like 60 seconds or it cancels. <laughs> well, we learned like that. I think it was on Google actually, but there was that a write up not that long ago talking about, you know, but they had all the warnings in place with their budget alarms and everything. But because of the delay in billing stuff, you don't catch that for a couple of days because you don't have the data. Right. So, no, this is not the yeah, preemptive. Budget, not a block. Preemptive. Yeah. <laughs> you want me to do what? On Glacier? Hold on a sec. Let me just check with your boss on that. Hold on. Wait, wait give me a second. Yeah, he said no. He said no. API. Yeah, I checked. He said no. <laughs> <laughs> I think he got it backwards. I think the account executives do get the message when you click those API calls and it's like, yeah. hey, <laughs> new car next month. You just made your quota. <laughs> <laughs> the, ca- yeah. the cash register fires in the background like, ching You're like, oh, someone just enabled Glacier policy. Mm-hmm. That's great. <laughs> on a very large bucket. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I'm glad to see this, though. It's always nice to yeah. uh, be able to use Glacier for less money. Yeah, I think this is an area they should continue to optimize and that batch capability that they tell you you can use to save money. It'd be nice if they just made that automatic so you don't have to worry about it so much. Uh, apparently, it's happy birthday to S3, which turned 15 on March 14th, 2021. And in honor of the occasion, Jeff Barr has taken a look back at the original blog post and has provided some updates to it and has now told us that they're soaring over 100 trillion objects and have regular peaks at tens of millions of requests per second and almost 13,000 objects for each person in the world, or 50 objects for every one of the roughly 2 trillion galaxies in the universe, if you want to get kind of crazy. Amazon is celebrating with a really fun event this week that I can't tell you about. Well, I could tell you about it, but it's too late, because it's this week. And they literally told us on Monday this week that they're doing an event this week, celebrating Pi and S3 together. So that's a bit of a disappointment. But hopefully they'll learn from their lesson and have those available to you on Twitch or YouTube or something, so you can watch those later if you're curious. Do check the YouTube channels. No happy birthday no. cheers. No one's singing happy it's birthday. It's not a sentient being. It doesn't know. I was going to make the joke that almost all of those objects were mine, and that it was very expensive to life cycle. <laughs> yeah. like it was beating a dead horse. This isn't lightning around the rhinos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we talked about it a couple weeks ago when we saw the official GitHub release for the ECS agent would support ECS exec. And now it's official it's on the official blog of AWS, which means it really happened. ECS exec gives you a simple, secure, and audible way for customers to execute commands in a container running on ECS, EC2 base instances, or Fargate, which I did not expect to see. ECS exec gives you an interactive shell or single command access to a running container, making it easier to debug issues, diagnose errors, collect one-off dumps and statistics, and interact with processes in the container. And with ECS exec, you interact with the running container without interacting with the host instance, opening inbound ports, or managing SSH keys, thereby improving the security posture of your container instances. And this can be enabled at a very granular level, such as the ECS task or service level, maintaining your tight security controls. Well, the Fargate workloads are the reason, the main reason why they had to have this feature, right? Because it's so many workloads was too problematic. If you don't have any access to the host at all because it's not managed by you, how do you get any insight into your running container? And so Kubernetes, you have the API layer and it handles that. So ECS really had to step up this and offer this. And it is fantastic. I've already played around with it. It's a little bit more clunky to set up than I'd like, but yeah, it's an amazing, amazing feature to have. And it's going to enable a whole lot of troubleshooting and debugging. It was a lot more complicated before. Yeah. So they did also integrate this into Copilot, which is supposed to be their way to make container development easier. So you should try to check it out with Copilot, see if that helps out with some of that, that rough edges that you were seeing. The 1990s called and said they wanted their shell servers back mm-hmm. again. Just still trying, to, <laughs> still trying to win lightning round. The nice thing about this is that it does output logs to Cloudtra and it logs each command with output to S3 or to a CloudWatch log. So you can go check out what your people are doing actually inside those containers as well, uh, which is great. You do need to be on the ECS optimized AMI for Amazon Linux 2 with container agent 1.50.2 or Fargate platform 1.4 or later. So it may require an update on their side to get this capability. But if you're keeping up to date on your Amazon AMI through Parameter Store, you should be in good shape if you're using the latest, greatest version. And them shipping those logs to an outside space just lets me know that there are other compliant workloads that are noisy customers of Amazon, because that is exactly why that exists. So it's awesome. So I just mentioned Amazon Linux 2 as a requirement for the last feature, and that is because this next story is about Amazon Linux one AMI for ECS optimized use cases. So in December 31st, Amazon officially ended their standard support and entered maintenance support for Amazon Linux one. And so if you've been a huge fan of Amazon Linux one for ECS, because you don't like the way that, you know, systems D works in Amazon Linux two, I have bad news for you. And that is that the ECS optimized Linux is going end of life as well as of April 15th, 2021. And it will enter an extended maintenance until June 30th, 2023. Hopefully for most of you, this is a simple change of your AMI in CloudFront or Terraform 
or some other simple process and this doesn't take too much work to change because Amazon Linux 2 is uh, pretty nice. I did the cloud pod when they first announced that they were killing Amazon Linux 1 last year and caused downtime, but it worked right after I fixed the downtime. <laughs> it's been running on Amazon Linux 2 ever since uh, without <laughs> any issues for the cloud pod website. So definitely glad I did that proactively versus now having a deadline of April 15th, which is just as bad as taxes. Yeah, I'm predicting a bunch of requested business in May of 2023 now. I'm just going to go put it in my forecast. Put it in Salesforce. Well, hopefully it'll be a few months before May of 2023. You know Most <laughs> likely it won't be May of 2023 and it won't be June. It'll be the first serious vulnerability for that OS that there's no patch for. Or I predict a story coming up in January of 2023 where we'll announce here at the CloudPod that Amazon is extending the, <laughs> the supported for Amazon Linux because customers have demanded it. For the foreseeable future. Yeah. So see how that goes. Well, I mean, I'd, another great reason to move to Amazon Linux 2 for ECS is, of course, the Graviton 2 instances. And Amazon has released a new one for us, the X2 GD instances, which use the Graviton 2 power for memory-intensive workloads. These are pretty beefy new boxes compared to the X1, which I was taking a look at earlier today. The X2 GD medium start at one vCPU with 16 gigs of memory and 59 gigabytes of local NVMe storage with a network up to 10 gigabytes and up to 4.75 gigabytes of throughput for the low, low price of $62.12 per month, which, you know, that's a pretty decent box for a lot of workloads right there. And, you know, the next step up, you go with two CPU and 32 gigs of RAM. That's also a pretty decent workload for, you know, probably $112, $104 or something like that, somewhere in that $100 range. That's a pretty good price. I definitely take a look at these. I would like to point out that I had to manually calculate these prices, though, because I went to ec2instances.info, which is now instances.vantage.sh, and it hadn't been. Uh oh. So, shame, shame, shame. Sign of things to come. Uh, if you want a much bigger instance, though, you can max this bad boy out at the x2gd.16x large if you want it on the virtual license side, or if you want the better metal version of it, you get the exact same thing. With 64 vCPU and a terabyte of memory. 3,800 gigabytes of local NVMe storage broken up between two 1,900 gigabyte disks, 25 gigabits of dedicated networking bandwidth, and 19 gigabits of EBS throughput for four grand a month. That's a pretty great deal, too. That's not a bad price for that box. No, not at all. Especially that network and EBS throughput yeah. at 19 gigabytes per second. Whew, that's a beautiful box right there. These new instances are 55% better on price per performance basis than their X1 generator. And they also clarified that each vCPU is actually an entire physical core of the Graviton. So you're not actually splicing those up, which you do in some of the Intel-based instances classes. So this is really great for compute-heavy EDA and financial services workloads and also encourages denser packing of your containers. So this is a great box. I want to use this very badly very soon. They're not hyper-threaded like the Intel CPUs are. So a core is a core. It's a single thread. And so it's, there's no noisy neighbor thing where sometimes you get good performance and sometimes you don't. Yeah, I think we, you know, often we complain, oh, there haven't been many price decreases recently, but we got to remember that releasing each of these new innovative options that decrease our, basically our cost per compute are huge price decreases for us to run our workloads. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it just takes more work versus an automatic price. Right. Cut. You know, and now <laughs> just count your money. And I have to update my automation code. Sit in your leather yeah. chair, recline it, and just count your money. Yeah. Yeah, just like when that new bill comes in, you know, the price is all of a sudden you know eight percent cheaper because you know they took some service that I use a lot of and they cut the cost. So. Hey everyone, Jonathan here. I just wanted to take a minute to thank the cloud consulting gurus at Foghorn for helping make the cloud pod possible. These folks truly get it. Cloud consulting experts since 2008, they are premier tier partners with AWS, Google Cloud Platform Silver, and Microsoft Azure partners. From multi-cloud to containers to moving full production workloads to the cloud under the tightest compliance, Foghorn's team of full-stack cloud engineers have been there, done that, gotten the t-shirt, and are ready to share their experience with you. If you're in the market for some talent to supplement your team, visit www.fogops.io slash the cloud pod www.fogops.io slash the cloud pod foghorn the promise of cloud delivered and this last one i'm actually kind of excited about this is the i am access analyzer has now been updated to include policy validation so i am access analyzer for those of you who've used it or tried to use it is a great way to kind of see what permissions your IAM policy or IAM role actually has. So this is a great visualization for that. It's nice for security people. And so, you know, by allowing you to now do policies, you can help to construct your IAM policy and your SEPs take advantage of time-tested AWS best practices and designed for use by devs and security teams. 
Oracle did not mention ops, but also ops teams. I don't know why Amazon was being special there. Validation takes place before the policy is attached to your IAM policy. With over 100 checks, each designed to improve your security posture and to help you to simplify policy management at scale, which is really great. I gave us a few examples in the blog post, and I also looked at a couple in the console myself. The first one up was security for policy elements that are overly permissive, and that may not be security risk, including things like IAM password in conjunction with a not resource or with a wildcard as the resource which is the bane of existence for most teams trying to do CICD. But that one is definitely <laughs> one you got to keep an eye on. Error for policy elements that stop the policy from functioning. This includes maybe, maybe syntax errors or missing actions or invalid constructs. They give you warnings if you're using deprecated global condition keys or invalid users or you're using ambiguous dates. And then also provide suggestions for elements that are missing, empty, or redundant in your policies. And apparently Amazon uses this for their own managed IAM policies and has deprecated managed policies from the results of this type of testing in the past which they did detail some of those things. They did complement some of the other well-known tools in the space, including Parliament and Duo Labs. But you know, customers apparently were asking Amazon to build this in an Amazon native way in the console so that while you're editing your policy, you'll be able to see directly without having to run a third-party tool, which I can definitely see the use case for that. Available to you at no charge, which is always great. Yeah, I can't argue with the price. You know, it's the access analyzer has been a great help for defining policies. You know, you could sort of look at your access and what services you're using and it's reverse engineer a policy out of that. And so this takes it to the next step of analyzing the incoming policy. And so, you know, as someone who's, you know, sort of a internal service provider on this platform, I can use this as to build up functionality into our CI C D pipelines, build checks and build up reports that I can share with internal teams. So this is fantastic. I love what this enables. It's been a great tool shooting tool. We've used it many, many times to try and figure out exactly why things were working the way we expected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you very quickly realize how you're you thought you were doing something because you thought you knew the IAM role and then realize oh no I need a different one or I need that one plus another one so it does come in handy quite a bit it is definitely one of the more common tools that I use as well it's like the worst curse of least privileged is that you know like you want to do the right thing but you're punished for it just over and over and over again as you try to create those policies and then as things change you get punished again yeah, your idea is really great. You do least privilege for your idea, then your idea gets you get a new idea for your idea, and you're like, "Oh, I'm going to make it better. And I'm going to do this thing." And then, oh yeah, wait, I have permission problems because I originally didn't design my service for DynamoDB, and now I don't have access to it. So yeah, there's those gotchas for sure. Well, and you know, there's a new IAM permission because Amazon announced a new functionality for you know, like the Lambda code signing what bit me, right? And I didn't have the permission for it, so you can't even read the Lambda three function anymore. Yeah, those ones are definitely kind of a bummer. I wish they would give more warning for some of those we're gonna be adding a new thing that you're gonna need <laughs> in the policy that'd be nice if they provide I don't know. That I mean, the reality is they could warn me but i'm not going to notice until i get that error be like that, what? that's true oh, right but at least then they can say they did tell you you just ignored it which is better for them worse for you <laughs> <laughs> well moving to gcp we have one announcement from google this week which is the launch of mission critical services mission critical services is for the most demanding enterprise environments and this is basically built on top of google's premier support Customers in demanding enterprise environments, even a minute of downtime can mean millions of dollars of lost revenue for them. And so MCS is available to help them address that issue. Unlike many premium services in the market that offload the burden of mission critical support to the cloud vendor, MCS is a consultative offering in which they partner with you on a journey toward readiness. Or if we don't think you're doing the right things per the Google's recommendations, we're not going to offer this to you. That's how I read that. Even better, it's built on the same methodology they use in support of the Google Cloud and a set of core concepts and methods from their SRE book. If you sign up for MCS, they'll ask you questions like, is your architecture designed with resiliency in mind? If you answer no, you're not eligible for the service. Do you have the right balance of control and agility in operating your mission-critical environment? If the answer is no, this might not be the service for you. Observability, are you instrumenting the right monitoring systems and signals for your application? Again, if this answer is no, this is not the service for you. Measurement, how you're setting and raising your SLOs to improve the most critical apps and services. Again, got to be yes. And once Google deems that you are truly worthy, their highest tier of engineers have familiarity with your code and your application. They will spin up a war room for you 365 days of the year within five minutes with their experts to help solve all of your problems. And so an example customer they gave us is HSBC, which is a bank, which is using MCS to provide a superior experience and uptime for business banking customers using the HSBC Kinetic service. And Kinetic is an app-based banking solution that offers a full suite of banking services, including direct debits, cash flow management, integration to third-party accounting, and more. And I have a quote from Paul Frost, HSBC Chief Architect of Wholesale Banking Technology, which is a fantastic role and title. 
AWC Kinetic is a transforming digital business banking and the customer experience. We're excited to use mission critical services from Google Cloud, which offers expedited GCP technical team engagement and continuous improvement. The collaboration with Google Cloud helps us to grow confidence and ensure our new HSBC Connect service for business banking customers is a success. Meaning they get to yell at Google when it's broken. But only if you did it the way they wanted in the first place. Correct. Otherwise they point the finger and say, tough luck. Yep. I think this is a service they don't actually want you to use. They just want you to go apply for. Like, um, wasn't it a show or two or two where they announced the, the sort of shared responsibility model, right? They did, yeah. Sign up for that. Yeah. The insurance auditing. Mm -hmm. and you guys and so this seems sort of in line <laughs> with that where it's like, well, they don't really want you to buy for it, but they do want, you know, like your CEO to force you to go through the process. <laughs> Well, it's like a great way to sell a lot of consulting services. Like, well, you know, I don't really have the right observability. Great, we can sell you consulting. And we can help you get your SRE team to be on the right track so you're managing the right things for your mission-critical application. Because you've already told us it's mission-critical because you're trying to get this service. So now we know you're willing to pay through the nose to make it work. Yeah, I mean, it just sounds like a rebrand. Maybe it's not, but it sounds like a rebrand of their CRE service, which was basically the customer-facing version of SRE the way Google does it. So I wonder if this, like, marries with that or if this is just a rebranding of CRE. Maybe. They did not mention CRE yeah. in the article. I you never do if you're rebranding. Yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> We're expanding our amazing CRE services with the new MSC. Yeah. Sometimes you do. Just depends. All right, moving on to Azure. Azure and AMD are announcing a landmark in confidential computing evolution, which means that Azure is now supporting the new Epic 7003 series processors. They complement existing Azure confidential computing solutions, such as confidential containers on Kubernetes, and opens the possibility to create a new confidential app without requiring your code to be modified. And so as part of this partnership, they are announcing the new HB v3 virtual machines for HPC workloads using, of course, the Epic 7003 processor. These new instance types of the HB3 VM is available in East US, South Central US, and West Europe, and coming to West US 3 and Southeast Asia very soon. The new Azure VM is powered, of course, by the Epic 7003, which gives you up to 19% higher per core performance, 2.6 times higher per VM performance for lightly threaded workloads, 1.9 times higher performance for large-scale MPI workloads, and multiple VM sizes so customers can deploy fit-for-purpose HPC compute. H-series high-performance local SSD with up to 7 gigs of read and performance and 3 gigabytes of write performance, and a much simpler NUMA technology uh, topology in the chip. The HB120 RSV3 node is 120 cores with 440 gigs of RAM and 2100 gigs of temporary storage and will cost you about $2,600 or $2,700 per month rounding. Why doesn't Microsoft buy AMD? That'd be kind of fun. I mean, the antitrust on that alone <laughs> would be a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a pretty beefy box as well. 120 cores, almost a half terabyte of RAM. Like, the sizes are getting pretty amazing. Or epic, if you will. Yeah, I'm not kidding, though. I mean, they would be dun, dun, more of a competitor to Amazon. I mean, I think it would be a, a good thing for antitrust because Amazon's designing their own chips today. Uh, but so is Apple. I think it really is that, you know, like if they weren't Microsoft, that you were probably right. Like I think that Microsoft has such a history of sort of playing with that boundary of antitrust that they're going to get a higher scrutiny and maybe it's not worth it. Like Draymond Green, basically. I mean, they were spin off. It's like that. For sure. <laughs> I mean, if they were to spin off Azure as a separate business unit because they didn't want to compete with Microsoft, maybe you can make an argument that Azure should buy them. But again, it's a big acquisition for even a company the size of Microsoft. I don't know that it makes any sense. Though. I mean, the chip makers have always partnered with Microsoft and IBM and Oracle to bring to market what was needed to run the software that the consumers wanted anyway. So I think they don't need to be acquired in order to partner and and be successful and bring things like this to mind. They don't need to, but I'm just thinking now that this is sort of their core competency with the IAS space, right? The cloud space. It's no longer the, we build the operating system, you build the desktops that people buy or the servers that people buy. It's one integrated I mean, offering. AMD is server or desktop and gaming line is also quite a big part of their business though too. So they're, they're still selling a lot of gaming computer PCs. They still have got, you know, the Threadripper CPUs, which are used for high-end workstations. Like they have a ton of you know really interesting things going on there, and their new video card architecture is actually kind of interesting. It's still not quite where ATI is, but it's definitely getting close. So again, it's AMD is a big company with a lot of different investments. Yeah, and there's a reason why you know when Amazon decided to acquire a chip maker, when Apple did, they didn't you know land on AMD. It's largely going to be due to size and price, I imagine. Yeah. Well, and, and the big thing they're buying is 
ARM manufacturers, right? And so they license the ARM technology from ARM, and then they can do their own version of the chips basing on the ARM architecture. So they basically license the architecture, and then they build their own chip based on the architecture. So that's what most of these people are doing. I think Microsoft did try to do that with the Surface, didn't they? Didn't they source their own ARM chips with the Surface originally, and then no one adopted it, so they abandoned Surface <laughs> on ARM? They were a little early. That's the problem. And also they were competing with themselves because they were also selling Intel and AMD versions of the Surface as well. So. I think what's more important, though, for any of these cloud providers is diversity because all it takes is for one critical defect, like a spectral meltdown in Intel, to really put a dent in your business if you can't work around the next you know, zero day kind of thing. So I think by diversifying and using AMD and their own chips and Intel, at least then they have something to fall back on and they may have reduced capacity for a while, but at least if there's something absolutely terrible that happens and they need to shut down you know, a third of their workload, at least they've still got a business to run the next day. I mean, in the Amazon space or even in the Google space, you've got ARM and you've got Intel and AMD. So you've actually got three options there. So you have a lot more capability. But again, it's a question of capacity on the ground and what do you have available to service load. So. Then the uh, Azure Defender for Storage, powered by Microsoft Threat Intelligence, is out now. Azure Defender for Storage has gotten these new capabilities this week, including the ability to alert customers for the following scenarios. Uploading a potential malware to blob storage using the hash reputation analysis. They can tell you if you have a phishing campaign hosted on your storage account. And they can tell you if your system is being accessed from a suspicious IP address, such as a Tor exit node. On the upload of a potential malware, it is only on upload. They want to make sure it's clear that you know this is not a continuous scan of the blob storage. So it's only when you do an upload to the blob that it actually detects it. And that's mostly because they don't support encryption keys. Because <laughs> how do you scan something if you don't have the encryption key for it? But in the blob upload process, you have potentially man in the middle opportunity to check it. So that makes sense. But yeah, that's nice. Having done a large S3 migration where you know malware scanning was a requirement, that's kind of a nightmare space. <laughs> that's not easy to use. And not, there's really no one writing stuff for like, I want to run that all through Lambda, or I want to run it through, it's still run it through an EC2 instance, run it through this process and do this terrible thing that's from 1995. But then you know you you know you don't have a virus in your file. So now the fact that it's actually built into the service, I do sort of like it is really nice. Yeah, because your options really are just to suck everything down and do it your analysis, which is annoying and expensive, or to do it in line, which just kills performance. So it's not great. So I like that they're doing this for you. Yeah, I like to see this one make its way to Amazon and to Google. To be honest, the vision campaigns on my storage account. I don't know. I mean, yeah, but like you've lost so many other security controls that they were able to even do that at that point. <laughs> I think that's the least of your concerns. I mean, isn't that just the, you know, the hosting of the static website or something like that? For yeah, that? exactly. Which means that doing? someone accessed your Azure storage account. They uploaded a piece of code. They configured DNS to get to that point, you know, to be able to host that page. Like that, just, to me, that seems like you've lost the battle in many other areas before this became the problem. I think it's detection. Detection sucks on that. So yeah, like, that's true. Your reputation is sort of like, not on the line necessarily, but impacted. Well, that is it for new news this week. Peter, you want to take us to lightning round? We have a general availability alert. Azure Media Services, HEVC encoding support in the standard encoder. It's now GA. I'm waiting for the premium HEVC support in the premium encoder to before I use this. I think Peter should get the point for just having to pronounce all that. <laughs> you can now achieve up to 35% better price performance with Amazon Aurora using the new Graviton 2 instances. Only 35%? It was 55 above, so Amazon's 20% margin, huh? Bummer. <laughs> yeah, if only savings plans applied to Aurora and RDS. Amazon Transcribe supports word level confidence scores for streaming transcription. Anyone else? <laughs> they give you the chance. Yeah. I was using Amazon Transcribe to <laughs> transcribe a philosophy show the other day. It said, I think, therefore I am, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but now I can give you that accuracy in a streaming conversation, which is even worse. <laughs> <sighs> Uh, that's crazy. Does it like put two or three words on the screen at the same time? Like it might be this, it might be this, it might be this. Like, you thought reading was hard, but reading three different versions of the same thing is going to be pretty awful. Well, I was trying to figure out how you do it in streaming. Like, okay, so I'm streaming audio to the web and you're literally transcribing it live and you're giving me a confidence score? Like, okay, thanks. Maybe you can put the text in like a, a bolder font or something to feel more confident. 
It's like, I really think this is what they said. <laughs> bigger, like, yeah, bigger so, word, yeah, right? The, the you, font size gets bigger and smaller based on your yeah. confidence of it. <laughs> That'd be so great. I can see it now, you know. We're streaming a live TCP show to YouTube and when you've got, you know, confidence based word sizes and people are going, why are the words going up and down? Like, like there's a whole side dialogue happening just on what's happening in the transcriptions. So you're explaining it. No one ever <laughs> listened to the show. It'd be a terrible. Well, no, presumably so they can actually just not put captions on the screen if they're really unsure about it. Which is even worse. Is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, really nice guy. Like, what did I say between those two things? You don't know, because there was no confidence. <laughs> no confidence. <laughs> Speaking of Amazon RDS, Amazon RDS Proxy now supports database connectivity from multiple Amazon VPCs. And the day you learned out that your multi-AZ RDS cluster never worked with the proxy. <laughs> Thanks. Didn't mm-hmm. know that one. Yeah. It sounds like learning the lesson the hard way for sure. Announcing support for multiple containers on Amazon SageMaker inference endpoints, leading to cost savings of up to not 35, not 55, 80%. So finally, you could justify to the CFO that all that workload that you're running through SageMaker, it's really just not that expensive after all, even if it doesn't provide that much value. It's all about price. Not value. The bigger thing is, you know, because what you want to do is you want to take your inference endpoints and you want to bin pack them because that's going to work out really well for you and your training models. Makes sense. <laughs> I just did a pause the show and ask, Peter, did you work on QVC in a previous life? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, not 35, not 55, but 80%. But wait. Crazy Peter slashing but prices. It'll also, give- <laughs> <laughs> it'll also give you five easy payments of twelve ninety nine. I also had a mattress company. <laughs> Separate shipping and handling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Call within the next 10 minutes to receive this special offer. We'll give it to you for free. All you do is pay for shipping and handling at sixty nine ninety nine for the shipping and handling. <laughs> oh, man, that, that call within the next 10 minutes then kills me when they repeat the same <laughs> every day for weeks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Call the yeah. next 10 minutes. Get this great deal. Next on the list, AWS Copilot launches version 1.4 with support for ECS exec, surprise, and more. Ryan, can I be your copilot? Only if you can exec directly into this container. Sure. I can do that. Okay. And yeah. And another GA alert announcing general availability of Amazon Coretto 16. I poured myself a lovely uh, cup of the Coretto 16. Uh, <laughs> it's a lovely burnt coffee taste, a little bit, a little bit weedy. Well, I get a little taste of a vanilla undernote to it. It's, it's very lovely vintage. I do enjoy the Coretto 16. I do highly recommend. <laughs> better than Starbucks, though, right? Anything's yeah, anything. better than Starbucks. But it's consistent <laughs> worldwide. It is. I get to Mumbai Airport and I go to that Starbucks. That Starbucks is the same crappy coffee I have in San Francisco. <laughs> that consistency of mediocrity is worldwide. And I appreciate that from Starbucks. That's all I, I just appreciate that. dessert coffees from Starbucks. Like, if you ever want tons of sugar and chocolate and whipped cream and then pretend you're drinking coffee, it's perfect. <laughs> Mocha Frappuccino. Those things are wonderful. Yeah. 2,000 calories in the Yeah. Awesome. Carb load, baby. <laughs> You're not supposed to not... look it up. You're not supposed to no, look it up. No, carb load. You just do it. If, you don't, if you don't know, it can't hurt you, right? they got to give it to Ryan. He made us put a blooper in. So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, Ryan's coming back. He's, he's aggressive. He's figured out his technique. Let's see. It's only taken a year. He's on. Yeah. You know, if it weren't for that blooper too, you were like in dead last in that round. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) For sure. (laughs) As usual. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Well, things are coming up once again here at the Cloud Pod and in the world of cloud. So Amazon is hosting a startup day on April 8th, which is going to be a virtual gathering of startup experts, founders, and partners to participate in a stellar education and networking event learning the basics of how startups build and scale on AWS from successful startup founders who have been there. And the answer I can tell you right now is serverless (laughs) and DynamoDB. (laughs) But if you don't know that and you want to learn more about how startups are doing their Amazon world and everything AWS, do check out this great event. These startup days are always a great highlight here in the Bay Area. And now they're going virtual, which is nice to see here in the COVID era. So do check that out on April 8th if you are interested. And that is it for the Week in Cloud. See you later. Good job. See you guys. Good night. Bye, everybody. 
And that is The Week in Cloud. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Foghorn Consulting. Subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and tweet us your feedback at hashtag thecloudpod. Or join our Slack channel, go to our website, thecloudpod.net, for sign-up instructions. Thank you.